Hello, I'm Dr. Randall Seacrest, your host for eOrthopod TV. Today I have as my guest Dr. Ty Tyondon. Dr. Tyondon finished his medical school training at the University of California, San Francisco. From there, he completed a neurosurgical residency at Yale. He completed a complex, minimally invasive spine fellowship at Cedar sinai in Los Angeles. Today, Dr. Tyondon is the director of the Neurosurgical Spine Center at University of California, Irvine. Good morning, Dr. Tyondon. Good morning, Randy. Thanks for having me. Today, what I would like to discuss is your approach to low back pain. Um, low back pain is, is as common a disease as the common cold. And I'm certain that, like me, you see this disease process on a daily basis. Okay, so uh, low back pain um, is actually the second most common uh, admitting complaint uh, in the emergency room. Uh, it accounts for about 15% of uh, sick leaves in the United States, and about 90% of us, by the time we're 85, will uh, have some uh, complaint of low back pain. It's a very ubiquitous problem. Well, and, and that, that brings up the point, what's causing this low back pain? Where, where, what's hurting in the low back? It's, um, it's uh, actually a very uh, complicated anatomical portion of, uh, of, of the body. There's a lot of uh, different things uh, down there that can cause uh, low back pain. It could be from the joints, it could be uh, from the bones uh, and uh, the wear and tear that normal life brings about. It could be from uh, the discs associated with it. There could be compression of, uh, of the nerve roots. There could actually be compression of, uh, of uh, the lower part of the spinal cord and uh, the cluster of the roots uh, that start, uh, start from there. Mm -hmm. so. Now, you know, a lot of folks who present to the emergency room or present to a primary care physician's office, they leave there, they present with low back pain, they leave that office with a diagnosis of lumbar strain. What's a lumbar strain? It's a, an umbrella term. Um, basically, in my, in my head, when uh, someone says lumbar strain, that means you need to see a specialist for a further workup. It means you've got low back pain right. and we don't know what's causing the pain. Right. It's, it's an umbrella term uh, that, uh, that a lot of physicians use, but um, um, it uh, really is a uh, flag that something may be going on that uh, needs to be evaluated and treated. Mm -hmm. Now, and you said that 90% of us are going to have um, some problem with low back pain, and my understanding is that the vast majority of those, especially if this is the first or second episode, are going to get better that's no matter what happens. Yeah, that's correct. And, you know, most of us from personal experience know that uh, you, know, you may get an ache or pain in your back, and over the span of uh, a month or even shorter, like the pain goes away. Mm. Um, in fact, uh, the data out there suggests that uh, patients that initially present with low back pain or radiculopathy and nerve pain uh, that shoots down the legs, uh, about 60% will get better in about three months. Mm. Uh, so, what, so what you're saying is even, even if you've got a pinched nerve or a herniated disc or something that is significant, and it's not just run-of-the-mill back pain that's, that's restricted to the back, that even those, a lot of them are going to get better without any treatment. That's correct. Um, that doesn't mean you don't need to see a specialist. You know, I think uh, if you are having a symptom uh, of, of low back pain or pain shooting down your legs, you need to be uh, seen by a doctor. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I think the, one of the uh, take home points is that a lot of people that do come into the office saying, uh, I have uh, low back pain, uh, may be able to be effectively and completely managed with conservative therapy. Mm -hmm. Now, it's interesting. I, I, I think that, you, as, as we've talked about, 90% of us are going to have low back pains at some point in our life. Why do you think that is? Why do you think that this is such a prevalent disease process in, in, in humans? It's, um, it's actually, it's a uh, bioengineering uh, issue. Uh, you know, uh, our spine uh, really wasn't made to, made for erect posture. We were, you know, creatures that initially were, uh, uh, probably meant to use all four limbs for ambulation. As we uh, walk, as we go about our daily activities, it places a lot of strain um, on the spine. Uh, the lumbar spine in particular because it sort of supports the entire weight um, of the body. And uh, there's a, a factor of 10 greater uh, of, of forces that are greater um, in the lumbar spine compared to, uh, compared to your neck. And uh, all this sort of uh, adds to the wear and tear uh, that happens um, uh, in, in your lower spine. Uh, the bones um, are constantly undergoing a, re uh, a, regenerate, a regenerative process. The uh, joints uh, tend to wear out a little bit. The discs, uh, because of the amount of uh, pressure and strain that they're under, uh, may give out. 
and uh, this is all registered by the body as, uh, as pain. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, people are always wondering what, they come in and they say, what caused my back pain, or, or, or they relate it to an injury. And there's, a, there's this great tendency amongst patients to identify, I was doing this and this caused an injury to my spine, I ruptured a disc, I injured something, I pulled a muscle. This injury concept is just so prevalent amongst patients and physicians. What are your thoughts on that? I mean, is back pain something that just occurs or is it always an injury? Um, I think I think both uh, both happens. I think there are some injuries that can result um, in some damage um, at that point that cause uh, pain. Uh, a lot of times, I think it's just sort of the process of having a degenerative spine that uh, then eventually having something that sort of tips you over the edge um, a little bit that uh, then uh, sort of is registered mm -hmm. as pain. So you. you you have all these aging things that are occurring. As, as we age, our spine begins to collapse, the discs begin to collapse. It's not as resilient, it's not as good a shock absorber. And then, but that doesn't cause pain. So you go on for years and years and years, and, you're, and although these changes are occurring, just like your skin's wrinkling, my hair's getting gray, those sorts of things, it's not causing pain. Then you do something crazy, or not so crazy. You lift a 40, bag pound, uh, 40 pound bag of fertilizer, and all of a sudden, boom, your back's hurting and you're down. Yeah first episode of back pain. Yeah. Or it may even be something as simple as sitting in a chair mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden noticing the pain. Um, the tipping point for every person is different, um, but uh, a lot of patients will come in saying, it happened on Thursday, you know, when I was doing this. Mm -hmm. And uh, it really, uh, it may not be that event specifically, it's just uh, at that point, you know, your spine may have just tipped over. Mm. Uh, now, obviously back pain is also a big, huge issue amongst the, the working class person, and, I mean, and when I say working class, I mean anybody that's working a job. So that, that uh, the workers' compensation system is always dealing with, with, with low back pain and work. There's a big controversy, as I understand it, whether you're at higher risk if you're a person, um, for example, a heavy laborer who works concrete, construction, whatever, lifting, twisting, bending, those sorts of things. Do you think that really puts people at, at more risk for developing low back pain over, for example, a sedentary office worker that is not doing that type of activity? Um, you know, I think uh, there's a little bit more wear and tear um, on the spine. Uh, the, it's, it's a little controversial mm -hmm. to say that, you know, maybe the, uh, maybe uh, people that are doing more labor-oriented tasks um, develop uh, are more susceptible to developing back pain. The uh, data suggests that at least there's a higher incidence um, of, uh, of uh, complaints of back pain um, in uh, patients that uh, have uh, more physical activity associated with their jobs. And, it, and to a certain extent, it makes sense. You know, you're using your spine a little bit more. Mm. Uh, there's a little bit more uh, motion. There's a little bit more uh, wear and tear um, on your back. And you know, you would think that that should lead to, uh, to more back pain. Um, the irony of it is, is that uh, in people that have desk jobs uh, that are seated um, for most of the day actually have a higher complaint of uh, pain from herniated discs. Really? Yeah. And, you know, it's the uh, seating and actually uh, being in a seated position actually places a lot of uh, uh, pressure in your, in your lower back. So just because you have a sedentary, I think the take home message is just because you have a sedentary job uh, doesn't mean that uh, you're not at risk uh, for developing. Uh, 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 lower, lower, uh, back, lower back pain, um, and it may actually, certain jobs may actually place you at higher risk. Um, well, it's an interesting point that you make, and I think that, that you probably had the same experience that I did growing up, where your mother always said, sit up straight, and, and er even people who deal with ergonomics, the, the normal way of sitting in an office chair is, is sitting at 90 degrees with your feet flat on the floor, and I think recent, um, recent studies have shown that that's probably not good for your spine. You're actually better in a slouch position. And so those folks who are always sitting in a slouch position at their desk are probably better off in that's terms correct. of their spine. Yeah. I think uh, ergonomics has really made its uh, you know, way into the, uh, the working environment. And uh, it's, it's uh, got a basis in, uh, in uh, sound philosophy. You know, I, think, uh, I think companies and people are becoming a little bit more aware of the fact that uh, there's certain uh, positions that can aggravate uh, back pain and that there's things that you can do to alleviate it or prevent uh, 
uh, prevent it from occurring. And, you know, you see these ergonomically designed chairs. I think those have a great benefit. You know, I think uh, having a workspace that's ergonomically designed uh, may cut down on the incidence of uh, certain uh, back problems that uh, people will develop over time. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think there's a definite uh, utility uh, to it. And I think people are beginning to really address the uh, importance of uh, being conscious of, uh, of uh, you know, posture and ergonomics um, when it comes to you know, dealing with your back. You know, two other things that we probably ought to bring up because I think they play an incredible role in low back pain. One's genetics. You know, it's m becoming more and more obvious to us that different people are at higher risk for developing, for example, degenerative disc disease. The twin studies have shown us that genetics probably matter more than what you do. So if you take a twin, one who's a heavy laborer, one who's a desk person, it's, it's so amazing how if you look at those people at age 50, their spines look pretty much the same. Right. Right. And it, it really is about the genetics. Right. The other thing is smoking, which, which you know, genetics we can't, we can't stop. Genetics we're born with, we're, we're going to have to just manage that. But smoking is one of those things that I think folks, you know, they know about heart disease, they know about lung cancer, they know about all the bad things about smoking, but very few people know the huge impact smoking has on your spine. Right. Smoking is actually one of the worst things you can do uh, for your spine. Um, there's a higher incidence of uh, degenerative disc disease, uh, uh, problems with the uh, cushions in between the uh, uh, vertebral bodies um, in your spine in smokers. There's a higher incidence of, uh, of just degenerative uh, spine disease uh, throughout. There's a higher incidence of radiculopathy. Um, there's even a higher incidence of stenosis in patients uh, that smoke. Um, in addition to causing these problems, it makes treating these problems a little bit more uh, difficult um, as well. And patients uh, that are candidates for surgical intervention for their spine, uh, spine problems, smoking is uh, uh, one of the issues that we have to address before we take the patient to the operating room. You know, we need to get them into a, cessa into a cessation, uh, smoking cessation program uh, because it really uh, works against uh, what we do in the OR to fix these problems. Uh, so it's a, it's a very uh, complicated, it's a very important issue um, in, uh, in, uh, in spine disease and something that really needs to be uh, addressed. Um, mm. Patients that come in complaining of back pain that are smokers, um, I think a very reasonable and holistic approach is you need, also need to address the uh, smoking factor as a uh, part of the uh, treatment for, uh, for you know, like back pain. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I think you mentioned surgery and the risk around surgery of smoking. And a lot of patients, they, they get the piece of, well, if, if you're gonna put me to sleep and do a general anesthetic, that affects my lungs. What they don't understand is that the smoking affects the healing of the wound. Right. It affects the, the fusion rate. I mean, that bone doesn't grow very well in people who continue to smoke. That's correct. So it's, it's, a, it's a much broader problem than just, you know, uh, we're trying to get you through the general anesthetic with less risk. So it's really about the whole overall healing process of your spine That's right. surgery. That's right. Even with uh, some of the newer technologies that we have, uh, with some of the proteins that we can actually implant that help bone grow, um, um, at the time of surgery, uh, smoking is the single greatest factor uh, that uh, can uh, cause an adverse uh, outcome from a uh, surgical procedure. You know, just not healing, not mm -hmm. the bone's not growing. Uh, to an appropriate point that, uh, that you need to treat the problem. Mm -hmm. So it's definitely a very important issue that needs to be addressed. You know, this may be an unfair question for a neurosurgeon, but what about nutrition? Do you have any information that you can share with patients about um, what changes in nutrition are important in people who have low back pain or are contemplating surgery for a fusion? Anything you tell patients? Nutrition is, um, is very important. One of the most important things that I think a patient can do is to be hydrated. You know, hydration is uh, directly correlated with, uh, with the condition of, uh, of discs. It, it, may, uh, it may help slow down the degenerative uh, uh, the disease process and degenerative uh, discs. I think uh, sources uh, of nutrition that help supply the body with collagen and vitamin C um, are important for, uh, for uh, maintaining uh, uh, discs and also for, uh, for uh, vitamin D as well for uh, bone, uh, uh, bone healing and bone, uh, uh, for, for the bones to be stable in, in uh, patients that have, uh, have back pain. Nutrition is a critical critical component in those patients, and I think it's uh, really something that uh, needs to be addressed um, in a holistic manner when patients come in. Uh, you know, their activity, nutrition, smoking, uh, medications uh, that they may be on, um, all need to sort of be uh, reviewed um, in a detailed manner by a physician. Now, 
Now let's move on a little bit to, to your evaluation as a neurosurgeon for a patient with low back pain. When, when you see that patient in the office, um, what's the first thing you're going to do? Uh, the first thing uh, really involves a detailed history and physical exam. Um, I think uh, you need to sort of figure out when the pain started, what caused it, what aggravates it, what alleviates it, uh, what's, uh, what medications they might have taken over the counter that, uh, that help it, what physical activities they've done that might have helped it or, or aggravated it. Um, those are all very critical key components that help uh, informing a diagnosis of about what may be going on. Uh, the physical exam will take the history and help you hone it down uh, to a specific uh, region uh, uh, of, of the spine uh, or a specific nerve or, uh, um, or a specific anatomic point uh, that may then help guide you in, uh, in picking an appropriate uh, imaging study mm -hmm. uh, to take a closer look at what may be going on. So you're going to start in, in you know, the, the, the age-old adage in medicine is that 85% of the diagnosis is made on the history. And it's even in low back pain, it's still very important. So you're going to start with that history. Then you're going to move on to the physical exam and then decide what to do in terms of, of test, imaging tests, MRI scan, CAT scan, those sorts of things, x-rays. What questions are you focusing in on with a patient with low back pain? What do you want to know as a neurosurgeon? What's the key points you're trying to get from that history? Right. You look, as a, as a physician, I look for how long has this pain been going on? Um, how severe is it? Uh, is this pain, uh, is, is the symptoms that the patient's uh, telling me, is it consistent with compression of the nerve root? Um, is, there, uh, uh, is there symptoms that are consistent with what we call stenosis, the narrowing of the spinal canal? Um, is this patient having problems walking? Is there, or is this patient complaining of any bowel bladder problems, which may be an indication of compression of uh, some of the uh, neural elements um, uh, that surround the uh, spinal canal? Um, how severely is this affecting the patient's quality of life? Um, these are all, uh, all issues that, um, that the, you know, when, it, when a patient comes in uh, with an initial uh, complaint that, uh, that I'm considering um, to help formulate uh, you know, the next step um, in, di in diagnosing and treating, uh, treating a particular problem. And when you go on to that next step, when you begin doing your physical exam, what are you looking for in the physical exam in a patient with low back pain? What sort of things are you trying to get from that information? Um, you look for what type of motions cause the pain, and uh, that can help you pinpoint what parts of the spine may be uh, the culprit. Mm -hmm. is, is there pain when the patient uh, extends its back uh, backwards? Uh, is there pain when he leans forward um, or turns to the side? Those are all, uh, all clues that help you uh, um, decide where the pain may be coming from. Is there a motor or sensory weakness? And if there is, what distribution is it? Um, those are all other clues that tell you what nerve roots may be mm. involved. Those nerve roots then help guide you to a specific point uh, in the spine. Uh, what we try to do as uh, physicians is what we call a clinical pathologic correlation. You take the patient, their story, and then correlate it with, uh, with the imaging studies and the tests that you have. And those two things really need to mesh together to uh, pinpoint what may be causing it. Um, a lot of times patients will come in and say, I have back pain and they have multiple issues going out, going through their, uh, up and down their spine. Um, but uh, the really uh, important question is, which one of those issues is causing the, causing the, the patient's uh, symptoms and, and, and addressing that? I think that really gives you the highest uh, uh, probability of success in treating a patient. So you're really trying to, to localize what we've termed before the pain generator. You want to know what's causing the pain. We see lots of abnormalities on the MRI scan all the time. Some of them are clearly just aging artifacts or, or things that are not causing any problems. They're, they're abnormal, yes, but that doesn't mean that they're pathologic or they're causing significant problems that need to be addressed. That's correct. And I think your point is, is that you don't want to see something on the MRI scan and focus in on that and that's different than what the patient is there for and you're ignoring what the patient is actually telling you. That's correct. You know, a lot of times patients will come in with a report from a radiologist saying everything that's abnormal with the spine and, uh, you know, rightfully so, a lot of patients get worried about that. Uh, but the, uh, the critical question is to ask is, is whatever's listed as an abnormality, is that really causing any of the symptoms that you're having? Mm -hmm. 
Um, all of us, I think any one of us, if we had an MRI of our back, would have some sort of abnormality with it. That's a normal process of, uh, of life. Um, and I think, it's, uh, I think uh, the, the clinical acumen is to identify what's causing uh, a patient's problem. Mm -hmm. And I think that really like, gives you the highest, uh, uh, highest um, probability of uh, treating a patient's problem. Mm -hmm. Well, as you move on to those tests and you start to do your own test after you've done your history, done your physical, what test do you find most useful in the diagnosis of a patient with low back pain? Where do you start? Generally, um, the first test is plain x-rays. Um, I think they give you a very uh, bird's eye view of what's going on uh, with the spine. Uh, the next step uh, may involve getting a CT scan. Um, it's a little bit more detailed view of uh, the bony anatomy of the spine. It gives you a better view of the uh, joints, what we call facets. It gives you a little uh, better view of uh, the space in between the discs. Um, if uh, if uh, there's a suspicion for soft tissue, uh, um, problems in the spine, an MRI uh, would probably be warranted. In fact, a lot of patients um, automatically just get, uh, get an MRI prior to even seeing a, a spine specialist. It's sort of the knee-jerk uh, uh, diagnostic uh, test. The MRI is useful because it tells you a little bit about the discs, about the nerve roots, um, about the, uh, whether the uh, spinal column itself is being compressed. Um, and, and you know, I think all three of those put together give you a very good uh, picture of the, of the spine. And oftentimes uh, it's not one or the other, it's a combination of a couple or all of those uh, modalities uh, in getting a very accurate picture of what's going on. Mm. Any other tests that you find useful in the lumbar spine? And you know, we've got multiple tests that we can do. Um, two tests that I'm very specific uh, or would like some specific information on are one, the electrical studies or the EMGs in the lumbar spine, whether you think that is a useful tool in the lumbar spine. Yeah, it, it definitely is a useful tool. And I think uh, when used in the right patient, it really provides valuable information. The uh, premise of that test um, is that it's an electrical study that helps identify a specific nerve and muscle group uh, that may be having a problem. Um, and uh, it's, it's valuable in confirming uh, what, what a physical exam may show you uh, on a patient is a, you know, a probable origin for the pain or, uh, or, or numbness. Um, and uh, I think uh, uh, it helps uh, collaborate uh, a clinical suspicion um, of uh, what the pathology may be. Um, and it's also a very useful tool for monitoring progress of uh, certain treatment modalities. And uh, I, think, uh, I think it's a very critical uh, tool. And, uh, uh, something that um, is being used uh, on a more frequent basis. So explain that to me. When you say use it as a tool to monitor treatment, it's, you know, a lot of people don't understand that the, the body and the nervous system is, is like a wiring di diagram on any other piece of machinery to some degree. The nerves go to specific places and the muscles that those nerves go to are almost rigid in the sense, rigid from the standpoint that they're always the same. There's a little bit of variation, but not much. So you test the muscle and, and you take that information and you can then make, make uh, uh, decisions about where the nerves are, are, are going and whether they're working well. So you can trace out what nerves are working and what aren't. If, if I hear you saying that, what you're saying is that if you have an abnormal EMG, you do an operation to relieve pressure, for example. So you've, you've identified one or two nerve roots that are not functioning well. And you do something to change that, that you can come back with the EMG and see that nerve repair itself or, or function better. That's correct. You know, it, uh, it's, um, it's really a, a, a snapshot view of how well a nerve and muscles are working. Uh, when a nerve's compressed, the muscle downstream is affected. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, when a patient undergoes a intervention that may alleviate the pressure on that nerve, uh, we may be able to pick up improvement in the nerve function and also uh, improvement in the uh, muscle that's uh, downstream mm -hmm. uh, to the nerve. And I think it gives the physician a very uh, good picture of whether, uh, whether um, it, what's been done was actually beneficial mm -hmm. uh, to a patient. So I think it's a very useful tool um, in, uh, in monitoring patients um, uh, after a procedure uh, that may still have some persistent pain or uh, numbness. Mm -hmm. And, and the other test, well, two other tests, let's talk about two other radiological imaging tests. One is a myelogram. In the old days, the myelogram was all we had to see or, or, 
or make some estimation of whether the spinal nerves were being compressed. And that test basically involves putting dye into, into the spinal fluid through a spinal tap and then taking x-rays. The dye actually showed up on x-ray, so you could sort of look and say, well, here's where the nerves are going because that's where the dye is going. Do you still use that test in your practice? Yes, absolutely. The CT myelogram actually was a predecessor to the MRI. Um, and it gave physicians an ability in the days before an MRI to look at the uh, nerves um, that were exiting uh, through the foramen, looking to look at the uh, spinal cord and whether it may be compressed at certain points. Um, to a certain extent, uh, the MRI has kind of replaced uh, looking at those sections of the spine, but to a certain, uh, to a certain extent, um, CT myelograms have made a uh, reemergence because it really provides a very detailed anatomy of the nerves uh, and the spinal cord as it relates to the bones um, around, uh, around the nerves and the spinal cord. And a lot of physicians find um, a lot of utility in using that. It's uh, especially useful in uh, patients that may be going to a physician after they've had spine surgery in which uh, instrumentation, metal has been placed uh, for, uh, for uh, fusion or what have you. And uh, you know, traditionally, if you get an MRI in those patients, uh, you get a very distorted image. Um, a CT myelogram gives you a very clear uh, image of what's going on and how uh, the nerves relate to the bone and uh, some of the uh, instrumentation that may, might have been uh, placed. So it's a, it's a very useful diagnostic tool in the right patient. And, and what about bone scans? You know, bone scans are used um, for lots of purposes, but uh, I've noticed an increased utilization of bone scans uh, to try to determine what's going on with a skeleton in the low back. What, what, and I usually tell patients, what I'm really looking for is, is what parts of your skeleton and your spine are under stress? What right. is that bone reacting against? How, how do you use a bone scan? Um, a bone scan essentially you know, lights up hot spots, you know, metabolic hot spots um, uh, in, uh, in a patient's spine. Um, and it can be an indication of, uh, it can help pinpoint where the body, if the body itself is identifying uh, that, uh, that there may be uh, problems. Um, it's uh, in, in the era of uh, spine fusion, uh, it's been used uh, uh, increasingly to sort of assess the efficacy of uh, spinal fusions um, to see at a certain point out from the surgery, is the body still flaring, uh, is, still, is the body still lighting that up as a hot spot? Mm -hmm. Is that a, a spot where there's a lot of activity going on? Uh, which is then an indication that uh, you know there's some sort of inflammatory process um, going on, that there may be something abnormal uh, going on. It has utilities. Uh, it has a very good utility in identifying uh, uh, patients that may be having pain from uh, tumors uh, that are involving uh, the vertebral bodies or uh, the bones of the of the, of the spine. Um, it, uh, it it again is a very useful tool in the right patient. Um, and but I think. Uh, it sort of needs to be put in conjunction with the physical exam and uh, the history and other imaging modalities to get a very accurate picture of what's going on. Are there any other tests, either radiological tests or anything that you do that you think is, is critical to the evaluation of a patient who comes to your office presenting with low back pain? Yeah, absolutely. There's a um, new technology uh, that we use, uh, dynamic MRIs, uh, which are an imaging modality that uh, actually images the patient in the position that causes the pain. Um, that gives us a better uh, view of uh, the pathology. Say if the pain is, say if a patient comes into your uh, uh, clinic saying, you know, the pain's really aggravated when I sit. Um, the traditional MRIs, you lie on your back, you get an image. We have the ability now to actually get MRIs with the patient in a seated position. Uh, that may, you know, show the disc that's being pushed out or a nerve root being compressed uh, in that position. That's uh, a new treatment, a uh, new imaging modality that, uh, that we have uh, recently available. I think some of the other things that uh, we employ are uh, diagnostic nerve root blocks. Um, it's, uh, it's a very useful tool if you suspect a, a patient with radiculopathy, a pain that's uh, radiating uh, down their leg, uh, we may be able to numb that specific nerve root, um, and, and it provides us with uh, two benefits. One, if it if it truly is the uh, nerve root that uh, is causing them pain, you know the patients usually uh, experience some relief uh, of their pain uh, from that uh, therapeutic block. Second, it helps us confirm that it, that is the uh, nerve root that um, is actually being. Uh, uh, is actually the cause of their pain. In patients uh, that have uh, uh, symptoms from uh, compression of their spinal canal, a condition we call stenosis, we're able to do epidural blocks, and uh, that also helps as both a diagnostic and therapeutic uh, modality for us. It gives us information, but we're also able to help the patient at the same time. 
Um, those are some of the other uh, commonly used tools that we use. Mm. You know, one thing we ought to probably point out to patients, and that is not all low back pain, one is, is coming from the low back. So there's always this thing in the back of our minds that we're always thinking, gosh, does this patient have something going on in their belly, such as an aortic aneurysm or something. That's correct. And, and I think that all people who deal with spine conditions, especially low back conditions, always have that in the back of our minds. So sometimes we may ask patients to do something crazy that they say, well, wait a minute, what, I've got back pain. Why are you asking me to get an ultrasound on my belly or a CAT scan on my belly? Because we're worried about that. The other thing is, is that is commonly forgotten, I think, is that there are other reasons that people's back hurt, like infection, uh, even ty some types of inflammatory arthritis, like ankylosing spondylitis, a, a rheumatoid arthritis variant. So pretty early in the process, you and I are probably going to order some lab tests to, to make sure there's no inflammation, you know, the, the things like a blood count, a CBC, uh, a sedimentation rate, and some of the newer tests that look for arthritis of an inflammatory nature. And I'm assuming that, that you do that as well in that's, your That's correct. I really think, you know, what you're alluding to is that, you know, when a patient comes in, um, that you really can't view them solely as a spine, that it really, you know, is a reflection of what may be going on uh, with other organ systems. Lab tests are critical. I think uh, there's certain labs that we can use to assess uh, uh, for rheumatoid arthritis, uh, as you stated, uh, you know, certain labs that we use to assess for an infection. Um, those are all very important. In addition, a lot of patients that come in, uh, especially with their lower back, complaining of pain in their legs, uh, may have conditions with the vasculature in mm -hmm. their legs. And, you know, an, th an important thing to distinguish is uh, the difference between uh, a neurogenic or spine cause uh, for, for the pain and uh, a vascular. Um, vascular cause uh, for that. And I think uh, it's really important to order the appropriate test and rule those uh, other possibilities out. Yeah, I would totally agree. Wait, let's move on to, to talking a little bit about how you then begin treatment with a patient. If, you, if you've evaluated a patient and you don't see anything that you think is, is necessary uh, to have surgery for, that, that it's clear that this is a problem and we need to proceed on and do something invasive. How do you begin to manage that patient as a neurosurgeon? What do you tell that patient and what's the first treatment modality that, that you'll try? Yeah. You know, the way that I view it, surgery is a modality that we have, but there's also uh, several other things in our armamentarium that we can use to uh, treat patients. Um, there are very uh, focused exercises, uh, physical therapy that a lot of patients will benefit from. Uh, there's uh, pain management uh, treatments that we could explore, um, injections, uh, epidural injections, facet blocks, nerve root injections uh, that patients uh, also may uh, benefit from. There are a whole family of medications uh, that we can use to treat patients, non-steroidals, antispasmodics uh, that, uh, that uh, may provide certain patients with, uh, with relief. There's uh, external stimulators, uh, non-implantable external stimulators that uh, may help uh, uh, electrically massage uh, both the muscles and uh, nerves uh, that some, certain patients uh, have some, uh, some relief from. Uh, in certain patients with mechanical uh, lower back pain, we may even be able to use certain specific braces to uh, uh, help, uh, help at least alleviate some of their pain while uh, we allow some of the medications and physical therapy to sort of uh, uh, help out. Uh, there are a lot of treatment modalities, uh, and I think uh, it really um, is a condition that uh, has, it's, it's, it's an area of medicine that's uh, evolved uh, significantly over the last few years, and I think patients with, uh, with back pain uh, really have a lot of options uh, available to them to help uh, alleviate the pain. So in, in your practice, you mentioned the pain management and the physical therapy. So if you've got a patient who has an episode of low back pain that's just not getting better to the point to where they've, they've come in to see a neurosurgeon. You've decided they don't have a surgical lesion. Pretty much in, in your experience and your practice, those patients are referred to a, a physical therapist and a pain management physician to sort of manage this early treatment phase? Well, we, the philosophy that we have is when a patient comes into us with back pain, they usually stay with us until we figure out a solution uh, for their pain. Um, they're not turfed out to a uh, pain specialist, but we work in conjunction 
with, uh, with the pain specialist who then is in direct communication uh, with us and, uh, and uh, we formulate a plan for uh, treatment. Mm -hmm. um, I think a lot of patients are afraid of uh, getting bumped from physician to physician, um, but uh, uh, in, our, in our practice, um, you know, we work in conjunction with physicians. We hold clinic in the same, uh, same uh, area at the same time. Uh, that helps uh, a little bit more of a collaborative approach. Um, and uh, even though a patient may go out for a pain management referral, they come back to our clinic and uh, we review uh, the, uh, the progress that's been made or hasn't been made and then sort of uh, revise a, a treatment strategy. So you guys have put together a, a, a pretty optimized team environment that, that everybody is working on the same basic plan for this patient. That's correct. And, and a more, as you said, collaborative approach. That's correct. You know, in our, in, our, in our comprehensive spine center, we have an orthopedist, orthopedic spine surgeon, a neurosurgical spine surgeon, and a pain management physician all working in conjunction with, the, with each other. We review the films uh, together and uh, we formulate a treatment plan uh, from three different perspectives uh, on how to appropriately treat uh, these patients. And I think that works out remarkably well. Mm -hmm. Now, when you start this process, how long do you think it takes or how long should a, a patient expect to be in this treatment process before they see some results? Is this, is this immediate? Is this something they should stick out for six to eight weeks? What's, what's the norm? It, um, it really varies. I think on average um, you would expect a patient to be in some sort of treatment plan for about six to eight weeks. Um, and I think, uh, and I say that on average because uh, in some patients that don't see immediate relief, they may find some relief a few weeks down and it takes a little bit of time for some of these treatment modalities to work. Physical therapy uh, may take uh, a month and a half to several months uh, to, in order for you know, a patient to adequately strengthen the muscles that support their spine uh, to a point that they may uh, get some relief from that. Um, some of the uh, more invasive treatments such as pain injections tend to have a more immediate uh, um, relief uh, and uh, some patients may see uh, relief at the time of the session or a few days um, uh, immediately afterwards. Um, so it varies a little bit, but I think on average patients probably need to be prepared to go through a, at least a six week course of, uh, of, uh, of treatment um, before they may notice some results. So if, if they're not seeing immediate relief from these programs, they need to have a little patience. That's and, right. And it doesn't mean it's not going to work. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean it's not going to work. In fact, a lot of patients, uh, you know, about a month out will start to notice some uh, uh, some relief. It's just uh, it's just sort of uh, a wait, waiting game to uh, to let some of those treatments take effect. Mm -hmm. Now let's talk about some of these treatments uh, specifically. And, and a couple of things that I want to address is is one chiropractic. You know, a lot of a lot of patients in this country um, really look to their chiropractor as the primary care physician for their spine. Some folks are. Uh, being treated by an osteopath, which are, are similar. I mean, they're different than chiropractors, but, but the similarities are that both use manipulation. And right. now, physical therapists have sort of gotten their own brand, so to speak, of manipulation. And there's a, a whole raft of physical therapists who really have focused in on manipulative therapy for acute and subacute low back pain. What's your take on manipulation and the low back? I think, uh, you know, my philosophy on it is patients are getting some benefit from it, that it's probably worth uh, trying. Um, there is a caveat, though, to that. Um, I think uh, in some patients that uh, have signs and symptoms of severe compression of either their spinal cord or their nerves um, uh, are probably at greater risk of injury um, from uh, manipulations uh, you know, that they may undergo. And I think, uh, for the most part, chiropractors and osteopathic uh, uh, physicians that, that, that do manipulations or, or physical therapists that do manipulations are aware of those uh, uh, signs and symptoms. Um, I think the safest uh, plan uh, for a patient would be to undergo these manipulations um, in conjunction uh, with the supervision of a physician. Um, I think uh, it's, uh, it's a very useful modality um, if it's working in certain patients, but it needs to be done under a very supervised uh, um, uh, condition to mm. prevent any uh, inadvertent injury. And, and what about some of the other um, what we would consider alternative medicine modalities such as acupuncture? Um, acupuncture, massage, there's different types of, of uh, sometimes referred to under the rubric as body work which acupuncture is a little different animal but there's lots of massage modalities um, different types of massage then there's rolfing uh, 
there's these things. What's your take on those? Are these useful with patients uh, who are suffering from low back pain? Um, one of the uh, symptoms of low back pain may be spasms or muscle knots. And uh, a lot of patients will say that they get some relief, uh, at least from the pain that's being caused by the spasms or knots from massage therapy. I think it's a very useful uh, modality. Um, it really boils down to, is the patient getting some relief uh, from that? And if they are, it's, it's a worthwhile um, endeavor. Uh, acupuncture is, is um, really, I view it the same way. If patients are stating that they're getting some relief and some will, um, uh, I think it's a worthwhile uh, modality to uh, pursue. Uh, the key thing for patients to realize, you know, people that under, decide to undergo those modalities, um, is that if it's not getting better or getting worse, uh, it may be time to see a uh, specialist. Now, when do you, as a specialist, uh, advise a patient that mm, we've tried this, it's not working. When do you make the decision to move on and maybe recommend to a patient that it's time to consider a more invasive option, for example, surgery? What, what leads you to that, to that decision? It's um, actually a big picture view. You know, we go through the exam, some of the diagnostic studies. Uh, we will probably try a course of conservative treatment. And uh, the funny thing is, Usually it's the patients that tell me this isn't working, um, that we need to do something a little bit more definitive. Um, and I think it really depends on the type of condition that a patient has. Um, with uh, you know, understanding what the patient's problems are, taking a look at their images, um, and seeing if there is something that we can effectively treat, um, those all sort of factor into deciding if we're going to proceed ahead with, uh, with treatment. Um, other important factors are it, how badly is it affecting uh, their quality of life? Is it impeding their ability to complete their job, um, uh, to work, uh, to you know, perform some of their tasks at home? Uh, you know, all those sort of factor in into a uh, decision-making process that may ultimately lead to surgery. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's interesting. Um, I think most spine practitioners have finally come to the realization that low back pain especially is what we would term, uh, the new term is biopsychosocial disease. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm curious and interested to understand your take on when you actually get the mind-body piece plugged into patients with low back pain. And when I say mind-body piece, I'm talking about what triggers you to consider having a patient see a, a pain psychologist and begin to work on the element of that biopsychosocial, the psycho element of the, of the process. And I'm not saying that, I think as, as a lot of patients mistake, that, that we think somehow it's a psychogenic disease process or it's all in their head. That's not what we're saying. I think what we're saying is that it has, the, the chronic back pain has profound implications for their psychological well-being, and we need to address that as well. Do, are you, are, in your practice, are you fairly aggressive with engaging psychological care providers as well. Yeah, I think you know one of the um, one of the most common long-term consequences to people that suffer from pain is you know depression. Uh, it's it's really the uh, the psychological aspects of dealing and living with pain uh, that uh, that um, kind of uh, will plague patients and I think it's really important to identify and I think it's very important to address because any sort of treatment modality um, really needs to be a holistic approach. You treat what's wrong and all the other symptoms associated with it. Um, I think a lot of patients um, uh, in recently have benefited um, from talking to uh, counselors that have a special expertise in treating uh, uh, patients with uh, issues that may result from living with long-standing pain. Um, I think a lot of patients also benefit from biofeedback um, as a modality that a lot of physical therapists that we refer to will use mm -hmm. uh, to uh, help uh, help register what kind of activities may, they may be, uh, 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 that may be doing them some good and also uh, uh, to more completely understand their pain and the conditions associated uh, with their pain. I think, uh, I think that biopsychological uh, aspect of pain is a very important part that can't be ignored and needs to also be addressed. Yeah, and I think you are accurate that, you know, I think the physical therapists do a better job of that sometimes than we do. I think they spend more time with the patient. I think they get to know the patient a little better. And I think they really tune in to some of those um, psychological implications of dealing with chronic pain. I think they also have a much broader understanding of the importance of that relaxation response and the biofeedback or meditation or yoga. 
any way that you can tap into that really uh, benefits the patients who are having to deal with chronic pain and uh, um, can be a huge, a huge help to them. Yeah, absolutely. You know, another important aspect of that is that um, a lot of patients that we see um, will be on a lot of pain medications um, just uh, to help treat them uh, with, with the pain. And if we are considering uh, some sort of procedure, you know, a very important part is uh, cutting down some of those pain medications or tailoring it to a point that after the surgery, uh, you know, we're able to uh, have it in a monitored way so the pain medication sort of weaned off and uh, um, cut down to a point that, uh, you know, we can actually see if the surgery is working and sort of monitor the progress. So I think it's very important to get those patients connected with a uh, pain management specialist uh, as well. So it's, a, it's very important to address those issues uh, before uh, thinking about doing something invasive. Mm -hmm. Are there any real key points that you would drive home to patients that you use to switch from a conservative approach to treating pain to when you would tell the patient, it's in your best interest to have surgery. And this is not really an option necessarily. It really would be in your benefit to consider this. Yeah, yes, there are. You know, that's a, that's a great question. Um, there are certain, uh, if a patient's having uh, symptoms of weakness, any motor or sensory problems, those are indications that, that uh, there may be something going on that's at a point where there's severe compression of the nerve. Uh, if the patient's having any bowel bladder problems, we consider those uh, uh, urgent issues that, you know, that we, can, we need to probably uh, address. Um, if a patient is having walking difficulty, if a patient has gone from walking to an unstably walking and unstable, unstable gait to you know now in a wheelchair. Those are issues that I think uh, we need to address on a more urgent uh, basis. Uh, you know they may not warrant uh, going the traditional route of conservative, uh, uh, conservative therapy. Uh, there are certain conditions that that based on imaging and the physical exam, if uh, if a patient has you know severe stenosis, those are things that we can effectively and easily treat with a high, uh, high um, high success rate. And I think those are things that. Uh, we could uh, talk to a patient about maybe sort of uh, directing more towards a uh, surgical um, uh, um, intervention. Um, I think uh, patients with a large disc herniation um, that's compressing a nerve root um, that can be treated effectively in, in, the, in a not so complicated manner, those are other, uh, other uh, that's another condition that uh, may, uh, may warrant a more rapid surgical uh, treatment. There are a whole host of uh, uh, conditions that I, that patients may benefit more from a, an, a, an invasive procedure than sort of pursuing a um, conservative, uh, conservative route. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like to me from most of those conditions that you've just laid out, if I could, could paraphrase, is that anything that's putting the, the neurological system at risk, you, you probably feel as a neurosurgeon, um, you should seriously consider surgical that's intervention. Right. That's right. And anything that's not is probably elective. Uh, but there's lots of things this day and age that, that even though it's not damaging or, or threatening the nervous system, there's a lot of things that can be treated effectively with surgery that 20 years ago we couldn't treat very effectively. That's the correct. results weren't as good as they are today. That's correct. And I think that's why it's important when patients are having symptoms to, uh, to see a specialist early on mm -hmm. and not wait till, uh, till their symptoms get uh, worse. Um, I think it's important to at least have uh, an opinion from a specialist um, at the very, very early stages. It doesn't mean you need to get something done, but at least have them uh, have someone that's uh, versed in uh, looking at those conditions uh, uh, render an opinion and sort of guide uh, the treatment that may, that may uh, eventually happen. Well, and it sounds like the, the situation that you're currently in at, at University of California, Irvine, with this multidisciplinary approach to spine disease, it really looks like the holy grail that, uh, that practitioners have been looking for. Patients who come in with a specific d disease process have everything under one roof that, that really they can access and, and get that information that they need and not be bounced from physician to physician. Yeah, I think you know, it's, um, it's useful for us as physicians to have those resources readily available and I think it's also useful for uh, patients because uh, they really um, are approached from a very holistic manner. Mm -hmm. Well, as we close on this topic of low back pain, especially your approach as a neurosurgeon, um, how you go about understanding and evaluating patients with low back pain, do you have any advice for patients, uh, and it's probably 90% of the population because we all have this problem, do you have any advice for patients 
uh, that you think they should know, key points that a patient with low back pain should know about making decisions about how to have their low back pain evaluated and treated? Yeah, I think um, the most important point is that if you are suffering from low back pain, you know, we have a lot of treatment modalities that can probably help. So the, the most important point is if you are having it, seek help. Um, go see a physician, go see your primary care physician, ask for a specialist. Um, and uh, have the appropriate workup done and talk to someone about what's available. Um, you know, it's, it's something that most people don't have to live with or it can be, it can be effectively treated. Um, and I think uh, it's very important for patients that are having, having low back pain to look for help. Uh, you know, and uh, they, there's, a, there's a lot of new technologies available, a lot of treatment modalities that may not even involve surgery uh, that patients um, can benefit from. Well, thanks. It's, it's been useful information, I think, for patients, and uh, uh, I think that I've learned a few things. Thanks, Randy. So Thank thanks you for, for having me. By.